Dr. Winnie King and welcome to Keeping Kids Healthy. Now, this is a program about your children's health and it comes to you, as you can see, right from the lobby of the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in the Bronx. Today we'll be showing you a fascinating medical condition called Asperger syndrome you probably never heard of but will instantly recognize. Remember those kids from our school years who behaved oddly, they failed at sports, or they never quite fit in with the other kids? Maybe they didn't know what to say in a group, or they talked forever about something like geography, but they didn't have a clue about the latest movie. They might be the smartest kids in the class, but they sat alone at lunch. Well, today we understand that odd behavior might have a neurological basis, a failure of the brain to develop the side that helps us communicate and understand complex social situations. Estimates on the number of people with Asperger syndrome range as high as one in 500, though many remain undiagnosed. Now we're going to meet a young man named Adam who has Asperger syndrome and who has a long list of accomplishments. Adam himself has graciously agreed to be our guide on this journey of discovery through the syndrome that has shaped his life. Reporter Jim Bunn spent some time with Adam. A healthy baby. Like most first time parents, Adam Sherry's mom and dad breathed a sigh of relief when the doctor told them they had a healthy baby boy. As he grew, so did their excitement. He was exceptionally smart. Give him a date even hundreds of years ago, and he could tell you what day of the week it was almost immediately. Adam! He delighted in the things most little boys enjoy. Okay, now we're gonna leave them. What do you say the most? Today, Adam is a sophomore in high school. He gets A's and B's, and he lives with a condition called AS, Asperger syndrome. It's a combination of social impairments and other difficulties. What kinds of problems does having AS cause you? For example, I don't always know the right thing to say in, so in a social situation. I may, I may not, not correctly read verbal cues. Mm -hmm. I may like, I don't have too many friends. I have a few, but not as many as I would like to. Mm -hmm. But and do you think that's because of the AS? I'm sure it is. Really? That must be kind of hard for you. Yes. What are some of the things that you see where you're different from your friends and your classmates? To say the least, I'm very monotone. Mm -hmm. There's also the fact that I, like, for example, I don't always know how to approach, for example, girls, like whether I should how to start up a conversation mm -hmm. with them. Uh, now, I have to tell you, that may not be an AS thing because a lot of us, <laughs> a lot of us have a hard time trying to figure out how good to talk to, to girls. It's good to know. Trust me. <laughs> but what are some of the other things where you can tell that there's something different? During lunchtime in the cafeteria, the cafeteria is extremely loud with hundreds of students literally talking to each other. Whereas I don't usually talk to people that much. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what it was like before when you were younger and it was harder than it is now? Is that better? I, ne I had no idea really how to have a real conversation with somebody. So what's new? And once I started social skills training around at, at age 10, you know, I really physically learned, so to speak, how to do it. What are some of the things you learned? Like how to say hi, or how are you, like conversation starters, like icebreakers, mm -hmm. as I call them. And in, within the past month or a couple months or so, I've really been able to make eye contact with people for the first time. As, mm -hmm. as, You're um, making very good eye contact thank you, right thank now. You. How did you learn to get past that? Because you certainly seem to be able to do it now. Yes. Thank you. I just, like, for example, what to say when, how to, when, to, when you start a conversation, what else to say, mm -hmm. and how to end it. So would you example. like to, I got an idea, would you like to end this one? No. <laughs> <laughs> this just is just kidding. This I'm, is kind of fun. Okay. Whatever you want. All right, good deal. 
Thanks, Jim and Adam. That was a fascinating introduction to a condition that I think most people have absolutely no idea, idea actually exists. And here to tell us more are two people who understand it very, very well. We have Dr. Michelle Dunn, and she is a pediatric neuropsychologist who specializes in Asperger's syndrome. And sitting next to her, we have Lori Sherry, who is Adam's mom. And thank you both for being here on the show. This is really, really interesting. And I really know that most people, probably even doctors, have never heard about this. Michelle, give us the medical background on Asperger. Well, Asperger syndrome is a neurologically based um, syndrome. Um, we're learning more and more about it every day. Researchers are learning more and more. Um, it is a genetically based disorder, but there's no blood test to diagnose it. At this point, the way that it's diagnosed is according to the child's behavior. And so there are three areas of difficulty that children with Asperger's have. Um, the first is in socialization. The second is in communication. And the third is in repetitive behaviors and sort of rigid kinds of behaviors. Um, the communication issues have to do with trouble having conversations, like Adam was saying on the tape. Um, usually kids with Asperger's syndrome have great vocabularies and they can really fool people because they sound so wonderful like little professors. Um, in terms of the socialization issues, there are problems with eye contact. Kids prefer to be alone rather than play with other children. Um, and when they do try to play with other children, they may do very inappropriate things, um, like even hit the other child, but not in a bad way. And the repetitive stuff has to do with um, talking about the same kinds of topics over and over again, like uh, New York City subway system, something like that, or lining up blocks, flicking light switches, or repetitive hand movements, things like that. Well, Lori, you were um, nodding your head just a moment ago. This sounds very familiar to you, doesn't it? Very. Tell us about your experience with Adam when he was a toddler. When Adam was little, we thought we had this brilliant genius on our hands. We were already making plans for him to go to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, maybe Cornell. Yeah. He was going to discover a cure for cancer because he knew his letters and shapes and numbers and colors by a year old. He was reading and reading the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times at age two. You thought you had a genius. We absolutely thought we had a genius. We, we never thought that there was anything that could be wrong with someone who was so smart. And it wasn't until he was in nursery school and his nursery school teacher said, I think something's not right, he's not interacting with the other children, that we called in a professional to observe him in school to prove her wrong because we thought she was crazy. And you know what? She wasn't. She was right. Well, down the road, you've come a long way, both you and Adam, with this, mm -hmm. getting the diagnosis, getting treatment for him. But you're involved now in educating parents about Asperger. And there's some things that you know now, looking back, that Adam showed you that you didn't pick up at the time. Tell us about that. He was a floppy baby. He would flap his hands. He would do this if he was excited or nervous. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know that that was indicative of anything. Well, we actually are going to show you right now a bit of home video of Adam doing exactly that. Take a look at this. Now, here he is. He's at the zoo. And it looks like he's having a wonderful time. And he's, there he goes with that flapping of the hands. It's, you know, it's that same thing, you know, of, of just moving the hands back and forth. Now, when he was doing that, did that strike you as being unusual? No, we thought maybe, well, with brilliance goes maybe some clumsiness. Sure, sure. <laughs> so that was okay. Yeah. Now, besides the, the flapping of the hands, are there some other things that you tell parents to look out for? If your child has an advanced vocabulary, although we all love that as parents, that could be indicative that something else is going on. Early reading, which is called hyperlexia, again, can be an indicator. A fascination with roots and maps and globes is not uncommon with children with Asperger syndrome. And also, the inflection in their voice, if it's kind of sing-songy or monotonous, with Adam, he had this very odd kind of uplift at the end of a sentence. Wow. Well, these are, are so easy to miss. And we actually have an example of this, too, that we're going to show you right now. Adam. <laughs> So it was that kind of zip right at the end of at it. At the end. And you know, that's kind of cute, you know, when you hear it, it doesn't strike you necessarily as, as being we something, know. you know, to be overly concerned about. But now retrospectively, that is all part of the syndrome right. to look out for. Well, 
one of the things that Adam talked about on the tape that we saw earlier was the social skills training that he's going through. Tell us about that. Our children with Asperger's syndrome need to be taught what other children know intuitively. That is, how to have a conversation. We don't think about it. But our kids don't know how to say, hello, my name is, what is your name? And we started getting him social skills training when he was younger, and that's been a great help to him. And it literally teaches them to say the right thing in the right situation. And in Adam's case, he got started when he was in elementary school. Yes. But Michelle, we want this to happen actually quite early in children's lives. Tell us about yeah. that. Why is that so important? Well, absolutely want it to happen early because children's brains are very malleable when they're young. And you can make a big difference in children if you start at a younger age. Um, Adam clearly has made a lot of progress. Um, but I think that he, a good example of this is that young children with Asperger's syndrome don't look at faces. And when we look at the research that's coming out now, there is evidence that the areas of the brain that are responsible for face processing are performing that job in a, in a different way, in an abnormal way. If children had that experience earlier on, if we made sure that they were looking at faces and getting all the information that you can get from a face at an early age, then perhaps we would change that outcome. Now, you mentioned earlier that this is a genetic-based disease. Yes. Does that mean that it's being passed from parent to child and that child grows up and then has children that could have Not it? Not necessarily. Um, in families of children with Asperger's syndrome, sometimes there's a history of manic depression, um, sometimes there's a history of AS or other kinds of developmental disabilities, but sometimes Sometimes there's nothing. Um, and so it's just a genetic change that happens. Yeah. Now, in your case, Adam has done extremely well. I mean, I know you're very Thank proud you. of him because very. he's very bright and he's also That's worked great. very hard. We want to give you a chance to let us hear about some of the accomplishments that Adam has, has made in his life. Adam's an honor student. He also learned how to ski when he was nine years old. He was the state finalist for the National Geographic Geography Bee three years out of three. Wow. And he has been in the school plays in middle school and high school, and he's doing great. Yeah. Oh, well, I know you're proud. I can hear Sorry. it in your voice. A proud <laughs> mommy. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it really is all the difference, getting this training and keeping him in the mainstream rather than having him segregated off yes. away from other children. Now, here are some phone numbers and some websites where you can get more information about Asperger's syndrome. The Neurological Institute of the National Institute of Health, and their phone number is 800-352-9424. Also, MAP services for autism and Asperger's syndrome at mapservices.org. Note that there are two A's in MAP, and their phone number is 219-662-1311. And Aspen, the Asperger's syndrome education network of New Jersey, and their website is aspennj.org. And if you missed any of that, the list is also on our website, keepingkidshealthy.org. Thanks so much for being here on the show. I really appreciate it. This is a fascinating topic, and we appreciate you sharing that with us. As always, thank you for watching. Keeping Kids Healthy. See you next time. Bye-bye.